What are you, but, 60, uh, 68, 69, Steve? Me? No, I'm 77. <laughs> going to be 78 this next year. And, uh, which I'll take all the birthdays I can get. Because you quit getting birthdays, you got a problem. <laughs> and, uh, but, yeah, I've been, I've been very blessed by the Lord to, to have survived as much cancer as I have had over the years. Um, my prostate cancer, we had a fire one one day I was I was on engine 11 <clears throat> and uh, it was a warehouse that was owned by American Fletcher National Bank do you remember what year this was this was 1980 let me think for a minute 1985 or 86 I think okay um, never did find anything we never documented anything back mm -hmm. in those days we didn't know anything about cancer and never even thought about it, you know. And guys, it, uh, but when we were inside this building and we were in there with, uh, we were the one of the first ones in with a line inside. And um, I had come, been in there and we were, it was in the summertime, it was hotter than blue blazes. And we just, <clears throat> we came out to get an, another bottle, O2 bottle. And started burning every every place that we were sweating it was burning i mean really? when i say burning it was i took a booster line off the engine and stuck it in my night pants and put it in my crouch area and it was that bad it was that bad i couldn't i could not take it and uh underneath my armpits my my neck um and years and years later, I'm going to say in about 2003 or four, Dick Van Sant, who was a battalion mm -hmm. chief, <clears throat> the union had him do some research on some of the fires where guys have got hurt because they took 23 of us to the hospital with the burns. And uh, <clears throat> it... Uh, but there was never no documentation. Couldn't find a fire, but Dick found it. He went through all the papers and stuff, mm -hmm. and he found this fire. And it says right on there how many guys went to the hospital. And come to find out that the what was burning inside this building was what they call microfish. And this was kind of a prelude of computers. Okay. They would put this uh, plastic stuff on the screens and then it would project onto something bigger so they could yeah. see it. And then the computers came along and they dumped all that stuff, And but they kept all it because they hadn't got it all taken over mm -hmm. into whatever with the computers. And uh, <clears throat> they don't know how the fire started, but the boxes that were, had they had all this stuff contained in had been treated with a, a chemical that produced formaldehyde. And formaldehyde produces cancer, prostate cancer. It's one of the one of the big things that it comes from that. And there I forget I'm not sure how many guys out of that twenty three of us have had prostate cancer over the years. And um so that's where I feel like that my cancer came from, my prostate cancer. My throat cancer, that was, in, that was diagnosed, in two, the prostate cancer was diagnosed in 2001. Uh, let's see, it was December of 01. And uh, <clears throat> so I elected to have it removed, but I was about six months too early for the Da Vinci style surgery, which mm -hmm. is what they do now, it's all robotic. So they did mine the old way, and some of the cells escaped out of the prostate when they took me, took it out of me. Mm -hmm. And but the doctor had told me at that time that he thought that they got it all and didn't see anything where it looked like it got out, but it did. And then in 2000, and I did really well then. And, uh, but then in 2008, my PSA started going up again. 
And uh, so I went through radiation. I had 37 radiation treatments to the prostate mm -hmm. bed. And while I was going through those treatments, I discovered a, something in my throat that was making me cough all the time. <clears throat> and um, so I took, went to the bathroom, shut the light off, took a flashlight, got up close to the mirror and looked at my throat, and I could see it. <clears throat> it was on my right side of my tonsils on this side, and it was a tumor. And so they went in and took my tonsils out, which I was 65 years old mm -hmm. then and liked to kill me. She said I was her oldest patient she ever had taken her tonsils <laughs> out. And uh, That makes you feel good. Yeah. But, you know, it, it took it all out. Yeah. But they had to radiate me to make sure that it wouldn't come mm -hmm. back. So I went right after they took my tonsils out, they let that heal up. Then I started 36 rounds of radiation for my throat on this side. <clears throat> and to this day, thanks, thanks for the doctors and the Lord giving me the blessings that my throat cancer has been non-existent. That's awesome. But my prostate cancer keeps coming back. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I had it, went through the radiation, it was good for another three or four years. And then it started again, <clears throat> and by then you, they have no idea where it's at. It, do, it didn't show up. They had all. I did all kinds of tests, but it it was there. My PSA levels were going, getting climbing up there, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> so I went to. Um, I was back at St. Francis again, and um, they. Uh, I started doing oral chemos, and I did those for four years, three or four years, and I, uh, when I got through with, with that one, well, I'm ahead of myself. My prostate cancer, and it come back, and that's when I found, I was working at Greenwood. That's when it okay. was. And I had retired from Indianapolis in 2000. With 33 and, years, right? 38. 30, 38 years at, Green, at, at Indianapolis. Indy. And then I spent almost another five years at Greenwood. You came out of retirement to go out work. Out of retirement, yeah. I, and yeah. they had asked me to talk to how I got interested in going back to mm -hmm. Greenwood was I started out my career as a firefighter, as a volunteer for Greenwood in 1967. <clears throat> and I stayed on, I went through, I stayed there until I went on Indianapolis and then I, I finally had to quit volunteering. And uh, What year did you get to Indy? What year did you start at Indianapolis? Uh, I started at Indy. Uh, I went through class in 1997. I mean, 19. <laughs> wait a minute. If it was 30, if 38 years, I'm yeah. not good at math at all. 1967. 67. That's when I okay. had. I went to start a class. We started like in August, and we finished in December. <clears throat> but we had two classes, mm -hmm. and. We were the last non-paid class. We didn't get paid to go to school. So we had a, a, a day class and a night class. Really? And I went, to, I went to classes at night because in the daytime I had a full-time job mm -hmm. and I couldn't afford to, to do everything. So they, that's how they did us. And we, uh, when we graduated in December, <clears throat> nobody got appointed until April, and April the 10th was the first appointment date for the first of us, and that's when I started. Um, I went, they sent me to my home house, what they call the home house mm -hmm. back in those days, and <clears throat> my home house was the 19s, which I hated. 
never had a run my first day there and um it was it was different and uh, back then it was a different era i still got to see what it was like prior to ems and we didn't have ems until see i was at the 11th so that would have been i was there two or three times but I never was, when I subbed, I, I stayed most of the time at Station 17, which is on Madison Avenue, right before Lily's. Mm -hmm. And back then, the deputy chief in charge of the shift, he had a magnetic board with everybody's name on it. Well, one of the guys at the 17s worked in a credit union, which was on the third floor of headquarters back then. Mm -hmm. He slipped in his office and took my name off the board. So he couldn't find me. He looked for me for 10 months. And I spent the whole time at the 17s. I never left. <laughs> and um, it was great because they were putting the interstate through behind mm -hmm. us, going through the south side. And we were having house fires every night, vacant houses, you know. And... Uh, <clears throat> And this was back then. They weren't this, wearing masks. They didn't have yeah. Masks. We didn't have masks back then. Three quarter boots. Three quarter boots, aluminum helmet, and a, a riding coat. tailboard. And rode the tailboard. Wow. There was times when I so would cool. have to ride up on the hose bed because there was no. They had three guys on the back, mm -hmm. and so I had to get up on the tailboard. So when they would stop to pull the hose out, to lay the hose out, I'd have to climb out of there real fast <laughs> so they could get the hose out. And, um, but I loved it there. It was, we had a, a Maxim engine tail border and we had a, a, a teller truck. I mean, an old one. This thing had some wooden ladders on it and stuff. <laughs> and we had a fire one night out at Kingens out on the west side. And so they put me up on top of the aerial and we're using it as a water tower. So it was up about, usually we never took that thing above 60 feet. Well, they didn't tell me that it would drop every once in a while. <laughs> and it was about, it was the middle of the night and all of a sudden this thing just drops. And I like, I thought it was going down. Boy, I come flying down that ladder and they told me, go on back up here, you'll be all right. It just does it every once in a while. I think I'm not going to go all the way down. And I thought, okay. Did it have you know. a bucket up top, or was it just a straight ladder? No, step? it was just a straight ladder. They didn't <laughs> have no buckets back in them days. How far do you think it dropped? Probably four or five feet, maybe, oh my gosh. or more. I, I, I'm going to say probably more. And, uh, yeah, I didn't waste no time getting down it. And, uh, but... The guys there, I, I love these guys. They they mess with me all the time, and we had an old um, phone booth in the firehouse that it was like a accordion door, mm -hmm. and they lock you in there. If I if I, if I was in there and they catch me in there, they would the door was shut. They would put a broom up underneath <laughs> the door so you can't get out. Then they took what they called waste. And what this waste was, it was just, I don't know what it was, like shredded <laughs> material. And it, our deal was every Monday, the chauffeur and the subs had to get underneath the engine and wipe the whole undercarriage down. Mm -hmm. And the reason they did that back then was so you could, you're looking for things that anything was loose and just maintenance. And, uh, well, they would take that waste and put it underneath the door set it on fire <laughs> then the smoke's all inside the phone booth and you're dying in there and they'll let wait till you're, you're about half choked out and then they'll let wow. you out you know that is, that's actually intense oh it was intense <laughs> but uh yeah they they tied me in bed one night just they did some really crazy things and the first night that i met george simington the chief was had uh, battalion four. It was Gene Haley, and Gene had brought him down to the seventeens to meet me, which I didn't know. And I I was in there, and I thought he was another fireman. He had uniform on mm -hmm. and stuff, you know. 
and he said something about being a pretty fireman, you know, and I thought, what the hell's the deal with this guy, you know? So he started following me around in the kitchen. I, I finally just stepped off the floor onto the top of the kitchen table and across to get away from him because he kept trying to hug me. And I, I thought this guy was gay or something, you know? And uh, so he chased me around the kitchen and finally got me cornered. And then he hugged me. And then I, as soon as he, I realized then that he, he, he wasn't right, you know? He wasn't and, uh, right. <laughs> but George, from then on, I love George. George mm -hmm. was just a, he's like a little kid. And Chief Haley used to take him all the time in the buggy. And he'd go around and eat lunch with the guys and stuff, you know. And he was, George is probably the biggest, one of the biggest things that was part of the Indianapolis Fire Department through all these years. Really? Um, nobody ever mistreated him. If they did, he got their butt whipped. Um, There's no reason to do that. And uh, he was... Uh, his health right now is not real good. Yeah. They had to put him in a nursing home, and uh, we just had a get together for a money raiser for him. Mm -hmm. And um, the place, the union hall, was packed. That's how much everybody thinks of George. And uh, <clears throat> but um, just a really good guy. And. Uh, well, I kind of got away from what I was talking That's about. That's all right. Earlier. We started talking um, about early on your career. Yeah. About some of the big fires. That, you had. I was at the 17s when I had the most fires. Mm -hmm. And I had a lieutenant there. His name was Ralph Johnson. And he was a lieutenant on the engine. And I absolutely loved him. He was like a stepdad to me. And. He told me the first night I, when I was there, he says, if you leave me on a fire, I will personally kick your ass <laughs> out in the back parking lot. He said, I'll give you the worst ass whipping you've ever got in your life. I said, well, I won't leave you. Then about two nights later, we get a, a grocery store over on Moore Street. I don't know how I can remember the, ad, the street names. I can't remember what I've done yesterday now, but <laughs> <clears throat> we had this grocery store, and we... Laid out two and a half. That back in two and a half was our supply line, mm -hmm. and we had inch and, and a half uh, hand lines that we used. And uh, but anyway, we crawled in this grocery store. This is before we had masks. And he told me to get my face down by the nozzle, and we can breathe up there. Both of us can. So sure enough, we crawled in there and. I couldn't get my face close enough to it to, to get air, you know. But uh, finally he said, told me to go out and get some air. But he said, if you go outside, don't you dilly-dally. You get your ass back in here. But he never did take a break. Never. He just stayed in there Stayed the in there. Oh, yeah. And he was, he taught me a lot. Taught me how to survive. And there was times when I, I'm really glad that he did. Um, what were some of those things that he, those well, he, tips that he Well, the main you? thing was don't panic. <clears throat> don't ever panic. Try not to panic. If, if you get into a situation, if you panic, you can't think. And I, uh, I was at the threes, and we had a uh, two-story... Uh, it was a uh, full of old people, like you know, I guess, like a nursing home mm -hmm. out on Bethel Avenue, and we took that. We got the the fire was on the second floor, so we went up a stairwell with the inch and a half and got right to where I we could get to the fire, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and my mask quit. I panicked. And of course, they always told us put your hand on the wall and go back the same way that you came. And well, couldn't see your hand in front of you for the smoke. And the wall jutted out, and I ran into that wall and knocked my helmet off and uh, fell on my back. And I crawled on the floor, and I seen I, I was about ready to give up because mm -hmm. I couldn't breathe anymore. And I got to seeing a light underneath the door. And it was a stairwell. 
And I managed to get to the stairwell, and that was the last thing I remembered. The next thing I remembered, I was in an ambulance taking me to the hospital. And uh, if I had just thought, and if I hadn't have panicked, all I would have had to done was kick a door in and go into one of those apartments, raise a window up, mm-hmm. and I could have got all the air I wanted. But I, all I could think about was getting out. And I thought about Ralph then. I, you know, he kept telling me, never, don't panic. Well, it's easy to say, um, but you don't want to panic. You're going to, you'll get yourself hurt. And um, an officer should not panic. They should be calm. Um, I had guys tell me they didn't even know if I was have a, we had a working fire or we didn't because my I try to keep my demeanor the same all the time and uh I don't think I ever yelled at all period because it just used to aggravate me to no end I had one female that would yell a lot on a fire and uh we we're up in an attic and she's yelling this and yelling that and I finally told her to shut the f up <laughs> And from then on, she quit doing it, you know. And she was a good fireman, yeah. she was. But she just get all excited and yelling and stuff, you know, and it just makes everybody get been out of shape, mm-hmm. and you don't want to do that. And that was another thing that Ralph always always told me, you know, and, and uh, he said, you always want to stay down as low as you can get. Because you, if you get up by the nozzle, like I told you, there, there's air coming out of the hose line, and it's like that on any of the hoses we got today. Um, we had, when we got our 5-inch, I hated that. I absolutely hated that stuff. And uh, in the wintertime, you can't hardly get it loaded back on the engine. Yep. Um, hard to drain. Mm-hmm. It's heavy. Heavy, it's yeah. Heavy. It's really heavy, and <clears throat> so I still we still had three inch on the engine. So I was laying three inch out, and Chief Chris Pitts was my chief and battalion chief, and he told me two or three times <laughs> to put that three inch out, and but see we had hydrants every other every block, mm-hmm. and. So it wasn't a water issue. And uh, we put out all kinds of fire with two and a half supply line. Yeah. And now we got a five inch, which is the greatest thing going. Well, it is a good thing to have. It's like having a hydrant with you. Yeah. But <clears throat> we had a house fire that morning and we were on our way back and a run come in on an apartment building over on the east side there. And it was one of those fires where you didn't, nothing was showing. And I didn't lay out anything. We went up to the third floor and I liked to shit. I, I mean, the place was full of smoke and it was hotter than heck. So we knew we had, mm-hmm. excuse me, knew we had a fire. And um, I ran back down and had the guys hump the whole, no, we didn't either. We took the three inch back <laughs> and uh, so when we come out of the out of the apartment building, I seen Chris coming. I thought, like, okay, it's going. I'm gonna get my ass ripped here. And I said, okay, time out. I said, look, I said, you didn't see what I saw at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And I said, I, I probably would have had the five inch out, probably. I said, but I guarantee <laughs> I like you, from here I'm on good. out, I will have five inch out on everything. He said, now don't put it out in the garage. He says, the house, residence, and you got a working fire, a building fire, by all means, have mm-hmm. it out from now on. I said, I will. I'll have it all out. So him and I, we had a meeting coming to Jesus there, mm-hmm. and, and uh, like he was right, him. and I was wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, But that was one time I got caught with my pants down. And, uh, but... Didn't happen too often. We just, I had the, one of the best engine crews in the city at the 27s when I was there. Um, 
I never had to tell them guys anything. I wouldn't. I didn't have to. They knew their job, and they if they seen what we had coming in. Mm-hmm. Skip was my chauffeur. Him and I were together for twenty years. Wow. And we knew what each other was thinking, mm-hmm. and he was always right. I mean, he was probably the, one of the best engineers I've ever worked with. And but the guys were tremendous. I mean, and most of them stayed there. We we had a group of guys probably that stayed there. We stayed together probably. Ten years before the guys got burnt out, you know, and had, went to slower stations, and um, I just never could see myself not being at the twenty sevens. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I love the station. I, I love the area. Um, even though we called it the swamp, and that's what we had on our t-shirts. We had the swamp thing on the on the back of our t-shirts, and uh, it was. Uh, our kitchen deal, I was a terrible cook. I hated cooking. I'd just, I'd buy the guys their meals if they do the cooking. And uh, <clears throat> I'd go to the store and everything, get what they wanted. But I just, mm-hmm. not a good cook, didn't want to be a cook. And uh, so I, they would cook for me because they wanted a decent meal. Yeah. And uh, anyway. Naturally, anybody does. After dishes, every day we would throw dice. And high and low would do the dishes for the evening meal and the lunch meal. Well, then we decided we'd have a roll off. If, if a guy, other guy wanted to roll off, and if you got, they would pick high or low, mm-hmm. and whichever one won, he didn't have to, you had to do the dishes by yourself then, <laughs> which I did that quite a bit. And uh, but it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, we did stuff. We played Chinese checkers. They had a board there that I know was there when I subbed, and this was in the old station that had the jail in the basement when I subbed there. Really. And uh, when I came on, like I said, we didn't do any EMS. We didn't even, we didn't do anything except fight fire. That's all we did. And so when they finally made us, all of us become EMTs, I was a holdout. I didn't, I thought, well, I didn't sign up for this, you know. And uh, so finally the chief came out to the station. He said, you're either going to go to EMS school with this next recruit class, or you're going to have to get off the job. I said, sign me up. So I went with this recruit school, and uh, I was so glad to get that over with. Mm-hmm. And then when I went to Greenwood, I had to go back to EMT school again. I like to croaked over, over that. But I I never opened a book. I thought, I told Frost, I said, if I can't pass this thing, I got no minutes doing it. But I got like 74 or 76% still an EMT, you don't make any difference, you know, <laughs> just like a doctor. First in class or last in class, you're still a doctor. And, uh, but the guys that, that C9 really made it interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeff Quinn was one yeah. of the main instructors. He was my instructor too. Yeah, he was, C9. he was a good guy. He's Jeff a, and Mandy. Yeah. Both of them. Now he, Jeff is up at Indianapolis mm-hmm. and, um, uh, but I see him quite a bit when I go up there, and I always go talk to him. But um, we had what we did. We subbed, and most of the time back then, I subbed for about a year and a half. That was all I subbed. Now there's some of them are subbing five years, really, because they. But now there's so many vacancies that they're going to going regular pretty fast now. Okay. Within a year and a half and um, <clears throat> I went to the my first house that I got assigned to permanently was uh, station 13 and this station was a new station they just built this station they tore the other one down to build a convention center there mm-hmm. and uh, <clears throat> this uh, the, the old station 
was at Kentucky Avenue and Maryland. And Chief Keith Smith ended up being the chief of the department at one time. And But he liked to burn the house down one time. He, we, we got a run, and he forgot to turn the stove <laughs> off. And the whole kitchen was on fire when we came back. And uh, But, yeah, it was... Um, the news station was pretty good. I mean, it wasn't bad. We had a big dorm that everybody slept in. We had an engine, a squirt, a snorkel, and a ready wagon, which was a pickup truck, basically, but with Purple K and, and uh, some kind of a, a foaming agent that we okay. had back then. Like A triple F or something <clears throat> like that. And... Uh, so they assigned me to that thing when I first went on, when I first went regular. Mm -hmm. Well, Don Breedlove was the chauffeur on it, and I just rode up front, just him and I. <clears throat> and uh, we had the silver suits on. And, I mean, we had those, and we'd go into these foundries yeah. where they got big oven fires and stuff, and we had to go there and put them out. And uh wasn't fond of that either, but that was different. But we'd play basketball every night. And him and I, we, got, we had a couple of other stations that we would go to mm -hmm. as soon as we got done eating that night. <clears throat> and finally, the battalion chief, after about all summer, we, we were gone in the evenings. He says, where do you guys go at night? I said, well, chief, I said, we go play basketball. He said, your basketball days are over with. Stay <laughs> here at this station. I said, yes, sir. So Don and I, out. we yeah. stayed there, you know, and but next door was the Ray Garter, <laughs> right next door, and of course it was. <laughs> so we really tried to stay out of there, but it didn't work <laughs> out too well. And Dutch Byers was the battalion chief, and, mm -hmm. and I always drove him extra when his when Keith Smith was his driver, mm -hmm. he was a lieutenant on there. And then, we, but Keith was always gone because he was in a young Republicans and stuff. He was mm -hmm. really motivated with uh, politics. Politics. And uh, so one night, <clears throat> there was probably eight of us. We'd go over at the Ray Garter and sit in the kitchen and had the door opened up mm -hmm. in the alley. And we all had a radio with us. And we'd sit, they'd have food in there for us, and we'd sit back there and eat sandwiches up and watch the girls out there, you know. And they'd come over and play volleyball with us a couple times until that quit. And uh, I don't see how that's a problem there. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, I, don't it, it I don't know how it could go bad. The way it went bad. We we got a run one night about one o'clock in the morning, and they had a, a railing mm -hmm. over to go into the engine house, and we had to we were jumping over it. Mm -hmm. Running to the apparatus, I looked up there, and Dutch Byers, the chief, was sitting in the buggy watching every one of us come across. I thought, oh my God, this is not going to be good. <clears throat> so he didn't say anything to us that night. The next day, when the other shift got gone, he called us all upstairs to the kitchen, and he told us that we couldn't go past the flagpole at night after 6 o'clock could not go past the flagpole out front. And if he caught any of us, he would lay us off. Oh, man. So we stayed back. <laughs> then we kept itching over a little bit further out and a little further out. And <clears throat> but, yeah, he was he was a good battalion chief. But he was, he was uh, strict. And I didn't mind that at all. <clears throat> um it seems, he was like, a hell it seems of like you fireman. knew where he, you huh? stand with him. It seems like you knew where you stood with him. Yeah, well, yeah. We all did. You know, I mean, we respected him. And um, I actually never really worked for a bad chief. Uh, I just had some chiefs that were really better than others. Um, my, uh, one of the, and he ended up being a shift commander, mm -hmm. was Pat Nix. Pat was a wonderful guy to work for. Him and, um, let's see, who else? 
there was one guy, was, his name was Lee Fulmer, and he was a really old guy when I first came on. And we had a fire up on any avenue in a pawn shop. Well, we're crawling in there, and we're all hacking and stuff, you know, and we, we get back in there, and I, I look down on the floor right next to me, and there's a pair of feet. And I thought, what the hell? <laughs> So I got where I could see up there, and it was Chief Fulmer. He had his pipe in his mouth, and he's a kind of tough down there, ain't a kid? And he goes, <coughs> and he walked on in. I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, this guy is, he was just something else. He was a good guy. They, his, he had a brother that the Fulmer Bar was named after him. And uh, But when I was at the 13s, we had a, a fire at the Hilton Hotel. It was the top floor, the 18th floor. Mm -hmm. And they had a, a, a restaurant on the top floor. And it was about, to, I just, just got to work, and I was putting my gear on the snorkel. And we'd been over to the Hilton the day before, three or four times on alarm runs and stuff, you know. They, it got to be a real pain. Never nothing. So... You came in as a Hilton Hotel, top floor. So we pulled out of the engine house. We couldn't see anything until we got to Ohio Street. I looked down. I was stand, we were standing up instead of sitting down. Mm -hmm. We were standing up, you know, and got to the whole top floor was going. I mean, wow. every, fire was blowing the windows out of this thing. had great big, huge plate glass windows in it, and they're all shattering out on the street, and people were running, and, so we took hand lines and we took our uh, extra some extra hose with us, and we would we took the elevator up to like the fifteenth or sixteenth floor, and that which we probably shouldn't have done that today's standard. You don't do that, but we walked the rest of the way up. We got up to the fire floor, and there was no the standpipes all the uh, handles that melted off of them, so we couldn't use them. So we had to take them back downstairs, the floor below, and start taking water off the off the standpipes. Mm -hmm. And um, we uh, after we got the fire knocked down, it was it was pretty cold, but it was the wind was blowing real real bad through the top floor of the little windows in it, you know. And uh, were you standing pretty far away from the windows and not getting even close? Uh, no. When we got up on the roof, I was the youngest guy on the truck. Yeah. So you're you're going up. I'm, they put me over the edge, over the serious? ledge. They took, we had this, like, I think it was called Manila rope. And, uh, I think it was made like out of hemp or something, but it was real, they were real strong, strong and everything. And they made a saddle. For me to get in, then so they like tied it up, and put a half hitch over my in front of my chest, put me over the edge, and I had to go. They were taking me around the top of the building, and I had an axe and a pike pole, and I had to chop the around the edges to get the fire to come out, so we could get the rest of it up. They'd hand me a line, and I'd hit it and yeah. put it back up and keep going. So, did they have a bracing up there on the top floor where they just held you in, or did they just hold the rope? Just held a rope. <laughs> and I told him, I said, if I, you drop me, I said, I'll haunt you for the rest of your lives. <laughs> and I was scared. I, I, well, I, didn't, I don't like heights, and that was really not my portrait. I can't even uh, imagine. I didn't like it. And so <clears throat> Chief Bansant come up there. They said, whose brilliant idea was to put him over the edge? And nobody answered. And they said, get him back on this side. Get him back up on the roof. So they, I was so glad they hauled me back up. And uh, that was about the scare, one of the scariest things I was. I just thought, oh, my God, if you drop me or... What was that like looking down 18 floors? Not good. <laughs> it was uh, it was a uh, puckering minute. Do you still remember that vividly today? Oh, vividly. Yes, I do. I surely do. It was... Uh, That's a great memory, though. But it was a cool-looking fire. It looked like a big Roman candle. When we was coming down Ohio Street, 
I looked up there and I said, holy shit, I cannot believe this. And after all the false alarms we had over there mm-hmm. all the time. You finally got something. Yeah, big one. And uh, that was probably one of the, besides the Grant Fire, I was on the mm-hmm. Grant Fire in 1973. And uh, I was at the Threes. They sent us out on a, I can't remember if it was a trash fire or a car fire. Right before, the fire had already, they hadn't set the, hit the box yet, it just was coming in. So they passed us up, sent us to this car fire. We pulled out of the engine house and we went across Virginia Avenue and I looked down and I thought, holy shit, I mean, the, you could see the flames in the air. And really? so we found this car fire in the alley and I mean, it was the fastest car fire put out you'd ever seen. And then we jumped back in service again. And then they, when they hit second, no, they hit, they hit second and third both. Mm-hmm. And we went then. And um, we had to put the turn the hoses on the apparatus out on Washington Street that was sitting out on the street, the aerials and everything, because it was burning the seats up on them, melted all the windshields and the, really? and the lights on top of them. And... So the chief had us take a, a hand line. We took two or three hand lines up, one after another, went up the sevens aerial, and went in the sixth floor of the building next door. We were trying to cut, to cut the fire off. Mm-hmm. There was an alley separating the Grant building and the Thomas building. <clears throat> so we were trying to keep that fire from coming across, and it wasn't working. I mean, it, they had so much fire, it just kept coming and mm-hmm. coming. And pretty soon, we just dropped our lines and ran through the building, jumped onto the roof of the next place, and they set the aerial over there so we could get down and uh, end up setting the Thomas building on fire, too. But it wasn't nothing like the Grant building. Mm-hmm. But uh, even the fire, uh, there was a uh, apartments across the street on the other side of Washington Street, which, you know, that's, back then it was three lanes on each side of it, four lanes, and the fire was radiating across the street, knocked the windows out of the apartments there, and set the curtains and stuff on fire in, in these other apartments on the other side, on the wow. north side of the street. And that's uh, a lot of heat. Oh, yeah. I, I think we used every aerial in the city on that one. And I can't remember now how many feet of hose we had laid out. I mean, it was miles of it. It just looked like every place you looked, there was just hose on top of hose. And um, the guys were, back then, they were hollering about <coughs> raise the pressure or mm-hmm. drop the pressure. And because we had all the aerials up and... Um, Probably the next, that evening, late evening, that, that fire come in at noon. And then late into the night is when we found, they finally got under control. And uh, But we had to stay there. And the next day, the new recruits come, and they got to pick up all the hose. Hey. Yeah. That's, that's that a good deal. That was a good deal. That's a real good deal. And, uh, <laughs> but it was just about every biggest part of all the engines were down. I mean, it's about all of our apparatus. We were just about out of out of manpower. And wow. Perry Township and Wayne and Warren, mm-hmm. all of them were covering our some of our engine houses because there was nothing. Everybody was down there. And uh, so they started putting us back in service as fast as they could. Mm-hmm. Of course, we, we were one of the first ones there, so we didn't get to go back. We stayed up the whole night. And then we got to mess with the new subs the next morning when they had to come in and pick all that hose up. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that was probably, and that was the biggest fire that I'd ever been on. And, um, but we had fires along Ninth and Canal, big three and four and five story warehouses at night would get them vagrants would be in the buildings and they'd set them on fire and 
which Roy is always is okay yeah. with us. Yeah, well, that's and, good. Uh, I had this one guy, his name was Larry Uli. Larry had Coke bottle glasses, about that thick. <laughs> so his eyes are huge. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were up in the snorkel, him and I and Gene Golden, and he had a 67 Ford convertible that he had repainted and yeah. put new bumpers on. It was a nice looking car. They delivered it to him at the engine house that day of the fire that night. And the next morning, the other shift's coming in to relieve us up there. And it's real foggy. Mm -hmm. Well, Larry oh, gets no. he gets in his car, and he's backing up and backs it. We're watching, and he backs right into a pole, oh. a big pole. <laughs> and it's rocking back and forth. And he was so mad. He, did, he went back to the engine house, got his clothes, and went home before we got back. Now, he... he Bent a bumper, the trunk lid. Oh, no. Yeah. But he couldn't see. <laughs> Plus, it was foggy. So, but uh, Larry was, he was a character. You know, there's always a character mm -hmm. at just about different houses. And he was, he was our character, you know. And <clears throat> he make you laugh all the time. And uh, we had a, another chief that was there on a B-shift. And I was working trade a day with somebody so they could go do something. But anyway, I was on it, working on the B shift that day. And it was Matt Speck and Bill Walsh were the two cooks. Well, Chief Gregory was just messing with them all day, you know, that morning and the day before. So they made chili that day put a little extra something in his chili for him. A little x lax Oh, God. And he come out in the kitchen. Of course, everything was upstairs. <laughs> he says, anybody, you guys, any guys shitting your brains out? And I said, no, chief, you got a bug or something, you know? And he never did know until after we all retired and told him what had happened, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> but... Yeah, it was. Uh, there, I guess, like the the first person that I rescued was on Christmas Eve night mm -hmm. in 1961, and I, I caught the hydrant, and when I went running up to the, we had a, an apartment building. And they had to ladder up, uh, hand lanterns, mm -hmm. ladders. And uh, so I went up the ladder and went through the front window of this apart apartment. And I crawled through there and I was searching for him and I missed him when I first went in. There was a lot of fire and it was real smoky and stuff. And anyway, I crawled down, but then I was starting to get worried about sevens engine coming up the stairwell and maybe if they turned the line on it was going to steam me mm -hmm. so I turned around and I'm crawling back towards the, the front and I see the guy's legs sticking out he pulled a chair over on top of him and so I grabbed him up and took carried him to the window and sevens had just got up on the roof of the of the porch and I handed him out the window to him and they took him down, and when I got downstairs, he looked like a young man. Um, I had no idea. He was 63 years old, I was think. Was he really? And his son had got out on his own <clears throat> before we got there, and it was on Jefferson Street. And uh, I, uh, the next day I went out to the hospital to check on Christmas Day. After we had our, I went out to check on the guy mm -hmm. to see if he made it or not, and he didn't. Mm. He died, and uh, so he. Uh, years later, I'm at the 27s, and I'm standing out front with my brother, my youngest one, <clears throat> and uh, somebody yelled from across the street, and I thought, oh, this guy's going to want money or something, you know, and so he come walking across the street, and he said.
is there a Steve Dillman here? And I said, yeah, yeah that's me. <laughs> is it good or bad? Huh? And uh, he says, well, he says, I've never had the opportunity to thank you for rescuing my dad. He said, I just wanted to thank you. He turned around and walked off, and I never seen him again. Wow. My brother was, he said, I feel like a jackass. He said, I thought he was coming over here, too, to want to borrow money or something off everybody here. And, uh, but... <clears throat> We uh, how did you how did you feel, if you don't mind me interrupting, when you when you made that rescue, what was going through your head? You know, I I really, I was trying to get through the heat, and then I had a, I had my mask on, mm -hmm. and but I. I don't know. I was looking for. I was so intent in looking for this guy. I knew he was in there, and when I passed him the first time and missed him, he wasn't where I thought he would be. But the chair was covering him, and when I came back through the hallway and mm -hmm. got into the living room again, I found. That's when I found him, and then my heart was. It was pumping. I mean, I excited. It's the adrenaline. Finding him. Yeah, the adrenaline, and uh, I. Uh, it was a feeling that I never had before in my life, you know. Was it like a euphoric feeling? Was it because uh, I've I've never never been able to do anything was, like that. So it was a relief, I guess, that I that mm -hmm. I did find him and, and he didn't burn up in there at that time. And uh, but then I was at the elevens, and uh, that's this was. Had to be in the early 80s. And uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, we got a residence fire over by Woodruff Place. And uh, we were the first engine in there. And they had uh, four kids trapped oh, upstairs. No. I'm sorry, three kids. Mm -hmm. And it, two brothers and a cousin. And they had a babysitter that was downstairs. She felt nine o'clock in the morning, she's asleep. Well, these kids, they took newspapers and she finally, the gal told us that's what she had found. They'd stuffed newspapers in there and then they got scared and threw the newspapers in a, in a uh, closet underneath the stairway. Mm -hmm. So we had a hard time getting in. There was so much fire coming out the front of those front door mm -hmm. and uh, so when we finally got in the, most of the stairs were burnt away and so we took turns they they threw me over the hole first and then the, uh, uh, the other guy off the sevens I think come in behind me and we're crawling down the hall and so I you, missed this so you were going to the second story yeah okay. going upstairs to the okay. second floor so they helped, they helped you go up to the yeah. second story gotcha and I missed the first little boy and I, then the second kid was down about almost to the end of the hallway. And I snatched him up and went on into a bedroom. Well, sevens, they reached, they got a ladder up there and they reached through the window feeling and they found that kid was right under the window. Wow. And snatched him out and then we had all three of them out on Tecumseh Street. And we were doing CPR on them and stuff, you know, and none of them survived. And it was, there wasn't a dry eye amongst any of us guys. <clears throat> to this day, I think that's one thing that has bothered me more than just about anything, is losing those three kids. And... uh Especially when you can still see their faces, you know. But um, it took a while to get to never get over it. But you you can you keep going, you know. You can't just quit the job or whatever. You just got to keep doing what you're doing. But it took a long time to get to where you could get over it. And uh, <clears throat> they. Uh, I lost three other kids, 10 o'clock in the morning. And 
It was over off of Palmer Avenue. I was on Squad 29 then. And uh, they were, one, two of them were laying on the waterbed and another one was laying next to it. And all three of them were in the same room. And none of those kids survived. Um, Nobody called it in and it had a really a good head start on us. And you just know in your heart that you did everything that you could do to, to have them survive. And, but when you do, when you do get one, it's, um, it's a, just a, you know that God puts you in the right place at the right time. And I've said this a hundred times, and I really believe in that. Um, the one fire we had up on Ewing on the, when I was at the, at the 27th, we had ran a, we ran the street the wrong way. Skip was gone. He was on vacation, and I had John Gregory driving in the engine, and I had a sub on the engine, and I forget who the other... Oh, Phil Cooper. That morning... The lieutenant on the aerial was off, so I took and moved guys around in the engine house to give them a break off the engine. Phil was my paramedic that was on the on the uh, engine. I put him driving the aerial to give him a break off the all the EMS stuff, and I put uh, John up front driving the engine, and. So usually, like up there, you, the ladder chauffeur doesn't put his stuff on until he gets on the scene. They don't, they don't want him driving in their boots and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, and, and then again, it's, it was in the morning, and it came in as a residence fire, but it was in the 13, 1300 block of... Uh, uh, Well, one way street going north. That, that, you said uh, Ewing Street. Ewing, that's okay. it. And so I just had John. I said, we'll just drive it the wrong way. So as soon as we got off, we got off 10th Street and went up Ewing, and we're flying down Ewing. And all at once, John slams the brakes on the engine. And he says, oh, my God. He says, look. And I looked over there, and this house is rolling. And it wasn't where we were going. We were in the 1100 block. So there was two fires going. Yeah. And so I immediately hit the aerial, told him, told him to come in north of us and come down. And uh, I seen the mother, she she jumped out of one door and had a baby in her arms. Oh, and the her boyfriend jumped through a window and I seen this, we seen this little boy in the front window, at the front window. And it, he was there one minute, and the next second he was gone. So, myself and Reed Latimer, and I can't, I, I can't remember who the other, it was a sub to, and... We went in, and but Reed found him, mm. and ra- had him wrapped up. He wrapped himself up in a blanket, and Reed found him under, underneath the, by the bed, and uh, we car- we got him outside. And I ran. Phil was starting to run up there, and I told him to stop and go back and get us equipment, all this uh, paramedic stuff, and brought him up there. And we Phil intubated him. Mm-hmm. And got him Good. going again. Awesome. Yeah, he wasn't breathing when we got him out. And this kid was about, I'm trying to remember, I think he was around four or five years old. And uh, the, um, the people around there couldn't believe we got there that fast because it hadn't been called in yet. I mean, we, were, we just happened up on it. Yeah. And... There, that's a good thing, I, and I've said that before in, in an interview that I had at the at the uh, museum. 
You can't tell me that God don't put you in the right place sometimes Mm -hmm. that you need to be. If we would have ran that like we normally would, we would have ran it down Olney, which is a wide street, and cut across 13th Street because we were going like to the 1300, middle 1300 block. And we would have been north of the fire. Wouldn't even been there. But we just happened up on it. And uh, a couple, two or three weeks later, I was up in the apparatus room and somebody rang the doorbell. And it was uh, the black lady and, and the little boy. And she said, is this the shift that had, was at our house on Ewing? I said, uh, yeah, it is. She said, would you have everybody come out here? So <clears throat> I had all the guys come out. And she went down and thanked every one of us and kissed every one of us on the cheek. And when she left, there wasn't a dry eye there amongst any of us. And I frosty called and I said, oh, we're going to all go to McDonald's and get a happy meal, you know. But uh, it was just, it was a great feeling to see him. That it makes was, it all worth it. Yeah, he was he was alive, you know, and... and uh, we had another night we had up on Coiner Avenue we had a fire a residence in the middle of the night and old man and old woman lived there and they had a a son that was probably in his 30s lived upstairs Mm -hmm. well we got in there the, the, the dad was on the floor right by the front door and the truck crew grabbed him up and took him out in the front yard and I went in and I found a walker in the kitchen. I, I could feel it. Mm-hmm. And I got up close enough and there was an old woman slumped over it. And it was getting really hot in there. And I grabbed her up, took her off the walker, and put her over my shoulder. And I went running for the front door with her. And but I, we got just about to the front door, and the whole kitchen took off. Really? Yeah. Wow. And uh, both of them survived, and and the son did. He got out on his own. He, he like a, jumped out a window, I think. It's like a movie. Oh, it was. <laughs> it's just, it's crazy. I mean, I, I, I've had the best career that anybody could have. I've I've been lucky. I've been really fortunate in my lifetime um just had a few bouts of cancer and it's um all part of the job and i wouldn't change anything nothing i'm very happy with my life and i'm happy the way things have turned out and uh, i go to bed and sleep good at night knowing that i've done the best i could do and uh it's um Guys need to cherish the job. That's what they need to do. It's uh, <clears throat> you need to be proud of yourselves, and uh, just um, yep, you need to be proud of yourself. Once you get on the job of being a fireman, it's um, it's the best job in the world. That's all I can say. I tell these kids all the time. What has been your most memorable fire that you've had? either in the command position or safety or in the fire operation side. Or you can do each wow. one. Oh, matter. man, I, I go all night talking fires. You are uh, more than welcome to. A couple of them, probably. I, I, I guess the biggest one I've ever been on is not really the most memorable, but they were both huge. I'd, I'd say the biggest one I was ever on was a Cosmopolitan fire down on the canal. I was safety chief. We were at old seven zero mass Avenue and shared quarters with the shift commander. So they got all the downtown boxes, but we didn't go till it was a working fire. I think it was box 95 that went out and apartment fire at Michigan and Senate. And I was laying in my bunk. They took good care of, we were, they put a Murphy bed in a hallway full of filing cabinets. You know, nothing's too good for safety chiefs. Mm-hmm. And that's where we slept at night. And I was laying there in my bed and, and I thought Michigan and Senate, there's no apartments there. I'm, you know, I, I thought North and Senate, you know, there's some, them, some three deckers up there and, and some railroad flats that, you know, we've done some work in. I said, but there's nothing at Michigan and Senate. And then I sat up and I thought, oh, Jesus, there. And before I could even think there's a big building under construction there, mm-hmm. it came out as a working fire. So I was going. Wow. 
And I went across Michigan Street, and I got to Capitol, and the cops had already blocked it off. And you, because of the downtown buildings and the lights, you really couldn't see. You know, you could see a glow and yeah. the smoke, and you know something was happening. And, you know, it was big listening to the radio traffic. But cops had already blocked off Michigan Street, and I'm, I'm flying down, and, and they back their cars up, and they're looking. I'll never forget the looks on their faces. And I look between their cars, and this giant, it wasn't even an ember, it was the size of two or three basketballs, hits in the middle of Michigan Street and just explodes, and he showers. And so I stopped, and I looked out, and rolled down my window, I looked out, it was, I think it was in November, March, no, it was in March, I think it was in the spring, but it was cold. And I looked up, and there was this shower of sparks going completely over downtown, and I thought, well, I'm going to park my buggy you know kind of upwind from it and uh, so i i turned and went up capitol and the cops were all waving at me like it's this way I'm, i think they thought i was afraid it's like that guy's not even gonna go he's going the wrong way on capitol avenue but i went up and parked on north street and got out and you could see the globe but there was a parking garage and these other flats that i that, that, that were there so you really couldn't see the building itself very well so i got out got my tank and everything Parked my car out of the way. I knew we'd get a lot of apparatus. The last thing you need is a chief's buggy in somebody's way, so I parked about a half a block out of out of the zone. And I go walking up, and I got to the other side of the uh, parking garage, and it was a six-story building in the front, eight off the back, down by the canal, and every floor was on fire. Wow. All six floors in the front. It was, it was a six-story lumber yard is what it was, and it was just walking through this building. And they had an inch and three quarter hand line out there spraying on it. I just, I, I stepped around the corner, and the first thing I, I said was, "Holy shit!" I had never seen that much fire in my life, really, on any fire, and I, and moving like that. So I said, hey, "Let's uh, let's get some deck guns going here, fellas, and let's kind of like forget the little <laughs> line. You're just pissing it off." And so, and so uh, we went around and. Uh, it's such a huge place. I don't, I don't know a whole city block wide and deep, and back in the whole. Uh, uh, sea, the seaside of it was uh, the canals. I mean, there was no access off of that. It was just ripping from top to bottom. And uh, we got some deck guns going. I got a couple engines up there, and I called for another engine. I said, I need to get an aerial here. And I walked back around, and there was the entrance to the Watermark Condominiums. And I stood and looked down this long driveway, and you could just see the fire coming at us. And there were these beautiful condominiums that were there, right built right up against the canal. They're probably a million dollars uh, a piece. And I wrote off the first one. I said, we're going to lose that one, and we're going to lose part of that one. I'm going to try to set up to where we can stop it at the third one. And I stepped inside the gate, and there was a lady standing there. She had holding on to a little Yorkie. I mm -hmm. kind of nodded, and she's crying. And she goes, "Are you? can you save my house? And I said, which one's your house? And she pointed right at the one that I'd written <laughs> off. And I went, yeah. <laughs> I said, ma'am, we're going to die trying. I did my best John Wayne voice, and she went, oh. <gasps> And so I just walked by her. I thought, no, lady, we're gonna. Yours gonna be a heap of pile of burning ashes here in about twenty minutes. You might want to go somewhere else and not see this ugliness. You know. Get you a hotel. Oh God, yeah, yeah. You need to call a Red Cross. We can get you some place to stay. And, but I walked down and I looked at it. and We had a favorable wind. I gotta say, and I hit incident command. Hit me and said, "What do you need up there?" Because you know we didn't have all the other chiefs in yet. So I found myself running this whole side of the fire instead of just doing safety. And I said, well, if I get an aerial and an engine up here, I said, I think we can we can make a stop. I think we can. So uh, they sent engine 23, which was still in Birdsville Parkway at the time. It came in the gate. And I thought, well, I got my engine. I said, go up there and hook up. And I said, I'll see if I can get an aerial. So I had to go down. There was a gated community. So we had to get the gate to where they could lock it open, find somebody could lock the thing. And I looked down the street. And I went to St. Clair. I can't remember the name of the street. It's one of those Wabash, one of those weird streets. His car's parked on one side, his gate wasn't very big. And I thought, well, I hope we get a smaller aerial in here. Well, here comes Wands around a corner, you know, 100-foot tower ladder. It's like, God damn it, thing's not going to fit. And Jerry Royston drove that thing in there, and I don't know how he did it. I thought, well, you're never going to get it out of here. I don't know how you got it in, but he did. He pulled it all the way in and set it up and had twin turrets on it, and 23 supplied it. I think they had their deck gun going, too, and they set up. So they had their twin turrets going, and then they took a Lauren II's was the Boston 23's engine, and they, and they took it down onto the canal and then got up. And if you look at the pictures of it, you know, you Google it, there's one little corner of the building, and then the watermark condominiums are right here, and there's only about 30, 40 feet between them. Really? And we we stopped it at those buildings. I mean, that was Kester's wow. last stand right there. I couldn't believe it. And it blew out windows on the other side of the canal. We had another aerial set up on the other side of the canal. It got so hot, I think it melted its red light and broke its windshields. I mean, it was a hot fire. Uh, that was our end of it. I didn't even know what was going on in the other end of it. There were uh, uh, firebrands landing on top of the, of the state house. Uh, there was the um, Indiana Historical Society sat right there on, on the, the Michigan Street side of it, and it got into that, and there was a great stop there. The guys got in there and stopped that, tarped, and did everything. Turned out a guy from I went to high school with 
was brand the Indiana Historical Society. And he called me a few days after that fire. He says, man, your guys are fantastic. He goes, they saved everything in our building. He said, we saw that on the news and thought our building's gone. I said, well, Larry, it should have been. <laughs> but yeah, they did do a hell of a job down here. And we were there all night. It came out after midnight, one, two in the morning. I don't remember what it was. But we got relieved at the scene and left, and it was still a good second alarm fire as we were pulling away. <laughs> so, you know, I hate to leave you fellas with all this work, but uh, the back end of it was still pretty much open and under construction is why it burnt. But the front was starting to be wrapped. They are starting to finish compute, uh, uh, apartments in there. You know, there was drywall and everything was up in it. And learned a lot about how fire advances in those lightweight trust buildings there's no rhyme or reason to it you know, it, it just takes the path of least resistance mm -hmm. so it might run a channel for a little while and then hook and go a different direction so we learned a couple things on that fire is to pull ceilings as you go because you never know where the fire is going to happen uh, leave a backup person or have a backup line because fire can get under you or over you real quick i mean you never know where those channel fires take off on you where they're going to go next uh, the air conditioning units, they set them up over the hallways, the ex exact width of the hallway. I got a couple pictures of them that when the, the roof collapsed, the entire condensing unit came right down. These were big ones. I mean, like oh, big yeah. as this room, big huge. ones. And they smashed straight down in to those hallways. And if there had been in line or anybody in there, they'd have been cut off and there was no way out. Uh, and you just, when anything's under construction, you got to be careful. Because I went up in at one point in time, we were trying to advance in and find the fire. Uh, and I went into uh, uh, one of the apartments and got down on my knees. Smoke was starting to bank down. You, know, you can't see your feet get on your knees and got on my knees. And I went out. I just had this strange feeling <clears throat> something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And I started feeling around. I just got a, like a different aura around me. I thought, man, that something just changed, you know, in the environment. I don't know what that was. <clears throat> so I laid out and reached over the edge of it. And I thought, well, there's a hole there. I don't know what that is. So there was a found something. There was like a box. So I threw it. And I never did hear it hit. And I thought, I know I was on the fifth or sixth floor. I said, well, this goes way down. It must be an elevator shaft. It was a balcony on the back side of the building. There was a courtyard on the inside of it. No railing or anything on it. If I'd have, if I'd have taken five more steps, I'd have gone five stories down into that courtyard. People wouldn't even know I was missing. They probably wouldn't have cared, but I, I would have. You know. So it, that, that was probably the biggest fire that I ever fought. What do you see the next big issue in the fire services? Oh, uh, boy. You've been doing uh, it for a while. So yeah. You, I, well, something. I think the thing that we're getting into now is uh, far more of the technological wizardry. Uh, I think you're going to see come about. We, we've got now uh, the SEMS units uh, for the Scott Air Packs that we've got. Mm -hmm. The uh, gauge block sends back a signal. We can tell everything that's going on with that air pack which air pack it is, how much air is in it, is it free-flowing, are they flowing any air at all, is there pass device on, we can do silent PAR, we can do uh, emergency evacuations off of it. Uh, and a lot of the older chiefs are like, I don't need this damn thing, you know. It's like, well, you know, it's, it's the wave of the future. It's what's coming. The electronic, you know, you're going to see turnout gear that may have biometrics built into it. Mm -hmm. Not only do we know what your air pack's doing, but we know – the ambient temperature around you. We know your body core temperature. We know your breath breath rate. We know everything that's going on. You're going to see SCBA face pieces that have uh, um, thermal thermal imaging built into them, and that's going to transmit back to a screen, and you're going to be able to see what your fire crews are seeing inside the building. Uh, you're going to have accountability and management systems that are all set up, and it's going to be the chief's role uh, and the XO's role is going to change quite a bit because somebody's going to have to monitor all that crap. And it's going to be very more disciplined, very more German-like, like we started from the beginning, mm -hmm. that somebody's going to be assigned to sitting and looking at all that stuff and maintaining accountability of people. Because we've always had, we've got the pack trackers, and you've always, you can get like the avalanche things where you can find somebody located, yeah. devices. Uh, but it's the X, Y axis, but you never saw the Z. You never knew, you know, were they two floors below or are they 14 floors above? Well, they've got technology now that solve that. So you're going to have something built into your turnout gear that's going to track you on the fire ground. So if you have a distress, you have a mayday, something that goes on, we're going to know you're at 110 feet up and you're this far out and the signal's going to come back and we're going to be able to locate you more. So all the little electronic wizards and gizmos that old guys like me really don't like screwing with because I don't have time for that. You know, it's like... And it's coming, boys. It's on its way, whether you like it or not. And it's closer than what you think. It's a cost-effective thing right mm -hmm. now. As soon as the, as soon as they get the costs down on it and they mass produce it, and a lot of the things that the military uses right now, it's, yeah. it's coming to us. 
I, I laugh when I hear guys say that, and I think, God, all the things I've seen in the fire service. I mean, you can go all the way back to when they built Station 12 on Sherman Drive. There was a last firehouse built for horse-drawn apparatus. Really? And when they delivered the Stutz engine out there to the captain, they said, here you go, stop using the horses. We don't have anything to do with them right now. We're going to leave them here. He refused to use the engine. Cause it do could, you remember what year that was? Yeah, 1915. Wow. said, you... Uh, you can't rely on that. You know, where am I going to get fuel for it? You know, if the thing breaks down, what am I going to do? You know, the horses are right here. He kept using the horses. They had to order him to use that engine and then move the horses out of there so he'd stop using them. But, I mean, was he wrong? Yeah, I mean, for his generation and his time, he was absolutely right. Where are you going to get fuel for that thing? You know, I don't understand how it works. I mean, all the things we look at today, and I, I look at what, from when I came on, the changes that we made from the two and a half inch hose with the brass couplings and inch and a half attack lines and the little fog nozzles and things that we had at the time, get low and whip it, you know, all this, all the techniques we did, those are all out the window right now. And when we started going to just night pants, we got away from, you know, the day boots into the bunk full bunker gear. Guys were like, oh, I'm not wearing that hood because I can't feel my ears. You know, my ears are my detector, whether to get in and out. Were they wrong? No, they were absolutely correct. But fires had changed you know they weren't yeah. staying up with with the thermal environment that had changed so much with light lake construction and all the you know synthetic materials and everything flashovers when i first came on they teach flashovers and backdrafts but it was a phenomenon you may see once or twice in your career hell you may see it once or twice a week now when you mm -hmm. see some of these fires i mean you, you really got to you know encapsulate yourself and protect yourself mask guys didn't want to wear masks uh we went to five inch hose, you know, we got three inch hose. That's as big as two, three inch lines or six inches. You know, it's as good as a five inch and all the things that we do now and don't even think about every one of those things met resistance all the way up the chain to now. Cause everybody was in the paradigm they lived in. They were in the generation they lived in and what it was that they thought was right. They weren't wrong. They just weren't, you know, Darwin said, it's not the strongest or the smartest of the species that survives, but that which is most readily adaptable to change. So when you realize you can't change, it's time to clock out, time to take the pension and go, you know, it's just, you've got to. And, and, and I can feel a lot of these electronic things, you know, I've got to ask my daughter, Libby, come on, take out my phone. You know, I don't have a Libby on fire scenes with me. I got Larry. It's like, Larry, how's this damn thing work? You know? And, and, uh, so, I mean, I can feel me kind of outliving my usefulness to a certain point. And when these things come in, I'm not going to like it either, but it's coming. And that's, that's probably one of the biggest things around the corner. It's kind of a downer question, but how do you deal with loss? Well, I, I learned it early in my life, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Uh, when I was seven years old, uh, my oldest brother was killed in an automobile accident. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember he was active duty Air Force. And we had, uh, he, was, he was working out of Bunker Hill Air Force Base, mm -hmm. was on his way home uh, after working up to about midnight or so. Uh, and his sergeant was actually following him story that I understand. Uh, he swerved to miss something, a deer, something came out in front of me and hit a tree. Uh, he lived for several days. Uh, it used to be a long hospital, had a serious TBI, uh, and, uh, didn't make it today. He probably would have lived, you know, with lifeline and with yeah. all the level one trauma centers and everything else. And that was kind of one of the things that led me towards the passion of the fire department. You know, if I could save somebody's big brother from being killed. It's like that, that was one of the real driving mo motivations for me. Um, and I've just seen so much of it. Unfortunately, it's just kind of how I've been I lost my dad at a very early age. I was 18, 19 when my dad died, uh, been around it. I, I had an older generation of people. I was the youngest of five kids. World war II was in the middle there that my dad went to world war II. So there's seven years difference between me and my next youngest sister. Uh, and, and, uh, 17 years different between my oldest brother and I. Uh, so like all the aunts and uncles, grandparents, I never knew any of my grandparents, they were gone. So I've grown up with loss and understanding it. And then when you get on the job and you actually see it, um, one of, well, one of the first, I might've been a volunteer for like a month mm -hmm. and American Red Cross first aider, I was going to go out and save the world. I was all pumped up, ready to go. And I was volunteering Lawrence and we'd work the ambulances from 10 at night to six in the morning. You had what they called rescue squad and you would handle all the EMS runs. Um, we got a run up on Pendleton Pike, up on, Shea, on 465 at Pendleton Pike. A, it was when CB radios were really big. And, uh, 
There had been a Volkswagen bus with two teenage girls in it that broke down and a good Samaritan guy driving around with his channel nine. Hey, good buddy. You know, CBs were huge and, and they were just good hearted people that would go around and help people. They're kind of like an in-dot guy now yeah. that does, you know, and they go by and help them. So they got a hold of her parents, her dad and her brother came out and then an off duty sheriff's deputy stopped with his girlfriend in the car. Mm-hmm. So there was like Jay-Z, daisy chain of cars down the right side of 465 and a uh, semi driver fell asleep, drove up on the side of the sheriff's deputy's car into those cars. And the dad and brother were down, and the Good Samaritan were down working on the back of the Volkswagen, and the girls were standing in front of it. So it was boom, boom, boom. Hit the girls, threw them back out on a 465. The, their bus hit them, threw them out. So there were two trauma ones there. Uh, killed the brother and the dad outright. The Good Samaritan got rolled between the guardrail had bilateral amputations of his lower legs. Sheriff's deputy saw it coming, and we didn't know where he was. He tried to jump over the rail, but got his foot caught. He had a tip-fib compound, and then he rolled down probably 20, 30 feet down the hill and was down there. We didn't even know he was there to begin with. And uh, I remember going around and looking at, at this guy, and I, I'm 18 years old now. <laughs> American yeah. Red Cross first aid, I didn't even put a Band-Aid on anybody, and here I am at this shit scene yeah. and I looked at the guy and, I, and he was blue I mean I thought he's dead and uh, it was Greg Gates was there Greg was trying to put tourniquets on him and, and I said Greg we got to move on this guy's dead and about that time his eyes opened up and he said I'm not dead God help me save me and I was done uh, I, I will never forget the fluids from the cars and the blood uh, running down the interstate into the sewer that was there i mean it, there was it was it was it, the smells the crunching glass I, I can smell it to today what happened on that run never forgotten that uh and i really questioned whether i could do the job or not at the time i thought man i it, you see this stuff all the time <laughs> i mean this is kind of and, and then the worst part of it was they transported him and then we got his legs and we put him in a couple pillowcases and we went to community hospital and we brought the legs in. Well, he'd passed away and they, they said, well, we'll take his legs. You know, you know, if I could put them back on or what you could do, you know, 1978, what can you do? Well, 1970, 78, yeah, I was, what can you do with this? 76, 1976, what can you do with these? And, uh, as well, he passed away. You know, when he, you know, I walked out into the ambulance bay and this guy comes in, he grabs me and he says, please, please tell me my son's alive. I don't know who he is. We're in the Ambulance Bay Community East. I said, well, who's your son? And he described the guy's legs I was just carrying. I'm like, you'll have to talk to one of the physicians. I don't, I don't really know, sir. I'm sorry. But, you know, he knew what had happened in Lawrence yeah. and saw Lawrence ambulances, my Lawrence patches and everything. I thought, oh, my God. Uh, so you get hit with that pretty early on in your career. I mean, that really, really sticks with you. I mean, you talk about PTSD and all these things. You know, it was, I went through all that. Uh, and you just, I hate to say it, but... You either cut it or you don't cut it. You know, you come to the grips. Mike Bray, the guy I talked about earlier, I went to Mike and said, Mike, I'm having trouble with this. He was my officer on that ambulance. And he sat down and said, well, did you do everything that you possibly could? What could you do better? Think through it, work through the problem and everything. And he helped me really through to the other side of it because I doubted for a while there whether I could do the job or not. I was, it, it shocked me. I mean, it, it really rocked me to the core because everything up to that point in time had all been theoretical. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to save lives. I'm going to be the toughest fireman there ever was. And a month into it, you're like, holy crap, I don't know if I can do this or not. You know, so you, 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 you learn to deal with it. Is there anything that you would want to say to this next generation of firefighters that are coming in that are bright eyed, bushy, bushy tailed, ready, ready? to serve for the next 30 years. Is there anything that you want them to know or want to tell them that will help them throughout their career? Uh, that's a big, big spectrum. That's a broad brush, but I think we narrow it want. down. Uh, I would just say keep the faith. Learn the job, love the job, do the job. I mean, train as much as you can, learn as much as you can, um, study as much as you can, get out of your own backyard, Find out what other departments do. If you can get involved, like in that Cologne Exchange program, or get in something, uh, you get friends on other departments. I mean, I know guys, and I can't go anywhere without, especially working with IndyCar. I mean, all around the world, I've got I got friends everywhere that we work with out at the tracks and stuff. Uh, learn from them, uh, understand them, uh, listen to these podcasts and things as they get and salty, and a few of the others that are out there you can listen to. Listen to what people have to say. Uh, keep your eyes 
and ears open, your mouth shut, uh, learn the job and love the job. It'll take really good care of you.